Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Discriminating Gamer, the board game review show that, on the day Avengers Endgame opened, shared a fake spoiler with his friend and uh, nearly cost him his friendship. Won't be doing that again. <laughs> Speaking of fake friends, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the Roman Empire, specifically Donning the Purple from Tompet Games. In Donning the Purple from Topic Games, two to three players take on the role of various families in the Roman Empire. The game board is a map of the Roman Empire, and each player is also going to get a little player board that kind of shows their family and their specific attributes. Now, critically, there's, there's spaces for different things you're going to be building and uncovering on your game board, and there is also a, a place for used stamina and unused stamina. You're going to get a number of unused stamina uh, cylinders that you're going to be moving to your used side, and that's essentially how you are going to keep track of of both your turns and your health during the game. Now when the game begins, one player is the Emperor. You also have another player who is the heir, and another player I believe leads the Senate when the game begins. Now what you're going to do over the course of the game is it's more it's better to be the Emperor, right? So you want to kind of maneuver to that position so Emperors can be assassinated, they can be killed, and other players can try to take their place. Now there are four rounds in the game, and each round has I think about eight phases. There's different phases that you go through every time. Now the first thing you do every phase is you essentially find out where the barbarians are. You go ahead and you roll die to determine where the barbarians are going to come out, and then you place them in that space. They're these little swords, wooden swords. You put them on that space, and then they're going to move. Uh, depending on they're going to all the provinces and the different regions are numbered. They're going to move like closer to one. They want to get to the capital of those regions. They're moving toward the capital uh, in descending number order. You then harvest grain. You're going to get a number of grain for, for if, if Rome is, is free, which it will be, um, but all the various provinces, if they don't have barbarians on the farms, then you get a number of grain there. This goes immediately to the emperor, who has his own special sideboard that he's going to go ahead and keep track of because he's got to feed the people at the end of, his, at the, end of the round. Next, the Emperor is going to draw cards. He's going to draw five different event cards, and these event cards are going to do all sorts of things. There may be plagues and famines that occur, or earthquakes, or other natural disasters. You may have uh, plots to assassinate uh, the Emperor or killing the heir. There's all sorts of different things that can pop up that are really going to change the game and set the stage for that particular round. You're also going to put out a forum card, and a forum card is a place where you can take different kinds of actions and get different kinds of benefits. Next, players are going to take actions. You can do different things uh, on your actions. You can try to bribe senators, essentially get your house uh, higher up on the senator track so that you control the Senate, which is going to have benefits for you. You may try to build a monument. If you build a monument, that means you can place a monument token on your player board that, again, will give you certain benefits up to and including victory points. You can also try to build a, an estate. Now, building estates are important because you're going to place them on the board, and every estate you have is going to give you a number of gold, a number of currency that you're going to use during the game, but they're also vulnerable because if barbarians move on it, you're not going to get any money for that. You can also attempt to assassinate the emperor. If you assassinate the emperor, uh, you can essentially, you go ahead, you, you roll die, and you can play plot cards that have a strength number in the bottom. The emperor can try to play strength cards too to, to kind of mitigate that. But also, too, you're trying to roll, you're trying to beat his stamina level. So if the Emperor's got a lot of stamina, the, the assassination isn't going to work very well. But if the Emperor doesn't have much stamina, you've got a much better chance of taking, uh, taking him down and elevating the heir, whoever that is at the time, to the Emperorship. You can also move your, your pawn, which is your family, you can move that to move, uh, attack barbarians, defeat barbarians. It has like a base strength of two, and you can add more strength to it by playing your plot cards. Now, the Emperor himself does have unique actions. He can build aqueducts, uh, which can combat uh, famine in certain areas. He can also train legions, essentially add more legions on the board that can give battle to barbarians, and he can move existing legions around the board. Now, during the action phase, when you build buildings, you essentially place them on a building track, and then you actually build the buildings during the next phase. Now, this is important because the more people that build buildings is going to push them further back, and you're only going to build the first four. So that means buildings that you want to build, if you're the first one to build, they may not get built that round. 
Now, at this point, the emperor has to distribute food, and he has to distribute a set number of food in order to feed all of the provinces. If he falls short, he has to pay the cost of grain, which is kept track of, in order to make up the difference. If he can't make up that difference, you're going to have the, the victory uh, track is going to move down. If that happens, then, of course, he kills the emperor, and the heir becomes the, the new emperor. Finally, everybody's going to collect taxes, so you get money for your various palaces. If you're the emperor, you get money for your palaces, as well as provinces on the board that don't have barbarians, and that's going to be a lot of money, potentially, for the emperor. Finally, at the end of the year, you're going to make sure that the, the barbarians haven't conquered enough of the empire that nobody wins. You're also going to award victory points to the emperor for such a good job he's been doing, and you're also going to discard plot cards to make sure you only have a maximum of three plot cards at that time. You also get to remove famine markers then, and you also get to advance the round track one more time. Now, you're going to go ahead and you're going to do this four times, and at the end of the fourth round, you're going to go ahead and count up all your victory points that you've got through all these various mechanics, and whoever has the most victory points wins Donning the Purple. Donning the Purple is a very interesting game. It's very unique in a lot of ways. Um, it's got this mechanic where you're constantly... It's almost like I've heard it described as King of the Hill. You're essentially... Everyone's trying to get the Emperor killed so they can take his place but you have to maneuver to be the heir before you can be the emperor so there's a lot of uh, skill and strategy that it takes there you got to get that taken care of there that's a very interesting mechanic and i like that quite a bit um, there's a lot of stuff in here that, that I like that I think is well done. It, it kind of feels a little Euro-y at times, the way you're, you're, you're manipulating the board and taking the di different actions. Uh, but there is some, there's dice roll, there's combat. Um, there's actually the glory dice too, where depending on a, when you kill barbarians, you get to roll glory dice, which will either give you um, gold or it can give you plot cards. You can get different rewards that way, and that's, that's pretty cool. So there's a lot of variety uh, in that sense. Now, the thing that really struck me as I'm playing this game is at the beginning of each of the phases, there is a lot of time where players aren't doing anything, where the game is kind of playing you. You do the barbarians, then you get the grain, and then you play five different event cards, and so, and then you get to the point where the players are, are playing, taking actions. And that was kind of disappointing because it was too much, it felt like. Now, I know what they're doing. They're trying to set the stage. They're trying to make each round feel different, and it works. But it's just a long time to let the game beat you up or, or even just manipulate you as opposed to you manipulating the game. And then, when it's a player's turn, he takes all of his actions. You go to the next player. He takes all of his actions. I think, I think you get two actions per player unless you're the Emperor. You get three. So I do my two actions. He does his two actions, Emperor does his three actions, and that's it. And consequently, that means you know, you're know you getting between 8 and 12 actions, I think, total in the game. And it, to me, it would, which is fine, the, the, the number of actions is fine, but it would have been nice, I think, for me, if it was, it was a more, if they staggered that a little bit. So it was like, you know, I take an action, then we play an event card. Then he takes an action, then we play an event card. Then he takes an action, then an event card. Then it's back to me with an action. I, I would have liked it more if it was a little bit more involved like that, a little more engaging every round like that. Instead, it's like, okay, all this stuff happens to us, now it's his turn. Okay, he's taking his time, now it's my turn, I'm going, now it's him, he's taking his time, now we see how this works, now we see how this works. And it just, so it was, ugh, that bugged me, that bugged me. It didn't kill the game for me, but it bugged me. The game's got a lot of good stuff here, and I, I'll say right now, this is not a bad game, by any means, I don't think it's a bad game at all, and there's a lot of good stuff here, but it's just not a great game. It's not a great game because of that, because it's it's manipulating you so much, and what you're doing is fun, but there's just not enough of it. And I wish there was more engagement from the player in this game, because what works here works very, very well. I guess what I'm saying, this is a mixed bag, so I have to give a, a, a very unsatisfying try it before you buy it. Thank you once again for joining us today on The Discriminating Gamer. As always, we ask you to please leave a comment for us on YouTube, on Board Game Geek, on our Facebook page, or on thediscriminatinggamer.com. We ask you to please like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and follow us on Twitter. We are The Discriminating Gamer, and i got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, you really shouldn't offer fake Avengers Endgame spoilers to people that don't usually use the F word, because they will use the F word. Please somebody help me on my feet again, and I don't know where I'm going. left me, my kids left me, 
My wife came back looking for the kids. 